Roche, it is our top priority that when you take your medicine, you know what to expect from it. We take your safety very seriously. That's why we continue to monitor the safety of our medicines after they are approved and available for use. We do this by partnering with you, with healthcare providers, and with health authorities in a process called pharmacovigilance. The story begins in the mid 20th century in Europe, where there were no laws that required drugs to be approved by a central health authority. That changed in 1995, when the European Medicines Agency, or EMA, was formed. One of the EMA's and other central health authorities' major responsibilities is to ensure that medicines are safe and that they work the way they're meant to. Health authorities do this by reviewing data from clinical trials. If the data show that the medicine's known benefits outweigh known risks, it gets approved and becomes available to those that need it. But even after a drug is available for use, we continuously check its risk to benefit balance. The supervision of a drug during clinical trials and after is called pharmacovigilance. Pharma comes from the Greek word pharmakeia for drugs, medicines, or remedies. And vigilance is from vigilantia, meaning wakefulness, watchfulness, attention in Latin. So pharmacovigilance is the process of standing guard over medicine. At Roche, there are three big parts to pharmacovigilance, monitoring, investigating, and communicating. We rely on reports from healthcare providers and people like you to keep track of any new adverse events or potential side effects that emerge. It's important to note that we keep this information highly confidential. We use these reports only to gather information about the medicine itself. Everybody at our company has a shared responsibility to report adverse events when they hear about them. There are over 2,000 people in our pharmacovigilance team whose sole job is to monitor adverse events. And reports come from all different sources. They could come from the patient taking the medication, the caregiver, a pharmacist, a doctor, and we can even find out about an adverse event from a publication. Once we receive a report, we conduct an investigation to get as complete of a picture of the situation as possible. We want to maintain an ongoing communication with the reporters so that we have that up-to-date information. Things like medical history, other medical conditions that the patient had at the time the event occurred, what medications the person is taking, how they were treated when they had the adverse event, and how they responded to the treatment. We're looking at the seriousness of the event. We're looking at whether or not our drug may have caused that event. And we're also looking at whether or not that particular event might signal that some patients are at greater risk of side effects from the drug than others. A critical piece of the pharmacovigilance process at Roche is communication. Adverse event reports are shared with health authorities. These and all other adverse event reports received by health authorities are accessible to everyone through a database known as UDRA Vigilance. All personal identification information is removed from the reports in accordance with local privacy laws. Roche is constantly reviewing and assessing all reports that come in to determine if the benefit-risk balance of a medicine ever changes. The company collects data from all around the world, so it's important for us to look at that in aggregate. It's this mosaic from which we try to extract any kind of pattern. And as we're getting more and more information, the picture becomes much more clear. So this means that we are creating an ongoing, an evolving understanding of the drug in the real world setting. If we identify a risk, we would update the label, even after it's approved. The label, also known as the package insert, contains important information about a medication. This is updated when we find that the balance of benefit to risk has changed. And when that happens, we also proactively communicate that information directly to healthcare providers and everyone else who is directly affected. Pharmacovigilance involves people all over the world who are reporting any adverse events they experience back to us and the thousands of people at Roche who are dedicated to your safety. And that's a regulatory obligation, but that's also our commitment to our patients.
Mirándote a los ojos podemos entender lo que es realmente importante para ti, para tu familia, para los tuyos. Nacimos para servir, entendiendo que antes que profesionales en salud, somos humanos, actuamos con empatía. Por eso buscamos una conexión real, centrada en las personas. Una persona que confía en nuestros recursos, en nuestra capacidad, en nuestra experiencia. Pero sobre todo, confía en alguien que le habla de tú a tú. Desde hace 44 años, nuestra vocación de servicio nos inspira a ser los mejores y a lograr grandes cosas. Por eso hoy, de la mano de Quirón Salud, crecemos y avanzamos con paso firme. Hoy somos más fuertes que nunca y seguiremos trabajando con el compromiso inquebrantable de cuidar y preservar la vida. Este es nuestro momento. Clínica Imbanaco, Grupo Quirón Salud, vocación de servicio. Buenos días para todos ustedes. Buenos días, Alejandro. Buenos días, doctor Rafael. Reciban todos ustedes un afectuoso saludo. Les quiero dar la bienvenida a nuestro Simposio Internacional de Calidad y Seguridad Paciente. Seguridad, una acción vital. Un escenario donde se promueve la gestión del conocimiento, que se convierte en el marco perfecto para destacar que, para Clínica en Manaco, es un propósito fundamental ofrecer unos servicios de salud de excelencia donde, precisamente, aspectos como la seguridad y la calidad en la atención médica al paciente son un aspecto clave. Es de nuestro interés generar estos espacios de tipo académico que les permitan a los participantes contar con un escenario de capacitación para impulsar el desarrollo de esta cultura de seguridad, donde además se pueden compartir e intercambiar experiencias con invitados de primer nivel. Efectivamente, Rafael. Este año celebramos la onceava versión de este gran evento que año tras año desde el 2010 cuenta con conferencistas de reconocimiento internacional en el tema de calidad y seguridad de la atención en los ambientes clínicos y con profesionales de la salud de los hospitales más importantes de nuestro país y en general de todo el mundo, quien a través de sus experiencias y conocimiento nos enseñan a mejorar continuamente en nuestro viaje hacia prácticas asistenciales más seguras. Tenemos espacios académicos dirigidos a profesionales, personal de la salud y demás grupos que intervienen en procesos para brindar servicios de calidad. Así es, el objetivo que nos trazamos este año y todos los años con este simposio es fortalecer y actualizar los conocimientos de los profesionales y de sus organizaciones de salud en la implementación de acciones seguras con el fin de disminuir los eventos adversos que puedan ocasionarles daños a los pacientes durante su atención. Así, para dar continuidad a nuestro propósito, este año hemos diseñado un programa que profundiza las situaciones cotidianas, analizando estos aspectos que en materia de seguridad de paciente se convierten en un reto para los hospitales y sus equipos de profesionales. En este espacio académico esperamos que encuentren nuevas metodologías, procesos y prácticas que beneficien a sus pacientes y que harán de ustedes unos mejores profesionales en la búsqueda permanente de siempre brindar el mejor servicio. Y es que promover la gestión del conocimiento surge como una alternativa de la clínica en Banaco para enriquecer su estrategia, su cultura, su estructura. Así favorecemos la difusión de la innovación. Además, Alejandro, como lo mencionas, es un factor estratégico de éxito para impulsar el aprendizaje colaborativo que a través de estos espacios integramos diversas instituciones de salud en torno a un solo propósito el de preservar la vida y la seguridad de los pacientes. Déjenme contarles que la dirección científica, apoyada en soluciones innovadoras y bajo los más altos estándares de calidad y tecnología, trabaja en tres líneas estratégicas a través de las cuales entrega conocimiento y genera valor en experiencias asistenciales, como convenios, docencia, servicio, educación continuada, investigación e innovación. En razón de lo anterior, en 2021, 
promoviendo la iniciativa de especialistas de la salud y del personal clínico, hemos proyectado más de 50 eventos académicos en temas de interés que propenden por el mejoramiento continuo de los procesos de atención, educación al paciente, formación y fortalecimiento de habilidades de sus profesionales. Reiteramos que para nuestra clínica es un placer contar con su participación en esta versión número 11 del Simposio Internacional de Calidad y Seguridad del Paciente. Seguridad, una acción vital. Y dicho sea de paso, Alejandro, quiero agradecer la presencia de nuestros renombrados conferencistas y personalidades del sector salud que han aportado a la ciencia y a la investigación. Gracias a todos ustedes por participar de este encuentro. Los invitamos a conocer de nuestra agenda académica en www.inbanaco.com, que con seguridad será de un gran aporte para usted y sus instituciones. Pero sin más preámbulos, sean todos ustedes muy bienvenidos a esta jornada de educación. Buen día, buena tarde, buena noche para todos los que se encuentran presentes frente a sus dispositivos. Para nosotros es un placer dar apertura a nuestro onceavo simposio internacional en calidad y seguridad del paciente, seguridad, una acción vital de la clínica Imbanaco, Grupo Quirosalud. Serán dos días de exposiciones donde tendremos a conectados conferencistas, muchos de ellos, todos ellos reconocidos a nivel mundial. El doctor Peter Lapgan, director saliente de ISCUA. El doctor David Bates y la doctora Sonail Desai. Y el doctor Stephen Mutin. Sean todos bienvenidos. En la parte de abajo de sus pantallas ven el icono de interpretación para quienes quieran escuchar las conferencias de los doctores en el día de hoy, que son en inglés, escucharlas en español. Sean todos bienvenidos de nuevo y de nuevo muchas gracias por estar aquí presentes. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Lachman and I'm the uh, uh, departing CEO of ISQA, the International Society for Quality in Healthcare. And it's uh, a great honor to be here opening this conference uh, with you. Um, I see there are over 600 people on the conference, and it's very exciting that there's so many people here to listen to what we have to say. We were ideally going to be in, in Cardi last year and then this year, but unfortunately the pandemic has uh, created this problem of not being able to travel, but we can do this uh, virtually. And our thoughts go out to all of you who are fighting the pandemic and to all those who have suffered as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I'm in lockdown here in Ireland. It's our fourth month and we're slowly coming out of the lockdown, but um, it's still a long way to go. So our thoughts are with all of you. Um, I'm going to spend uh, the next 40 minutes or so uh, talking about uh, respect and safety, which is so apt right now here in the time uh, of COVID. And I'll leave a few minutes for some questions at the end. Um, respect is something that uh, Astolfo and I have spoken about previously, and that's why I think it is important now uh, to us to consider what we really need to do as we go forward with patient safety in the future. Just to let you know about ISQA, it's an international society with members in every just about every country in every part of the world, over a thousand members and over a hundred organizations. And we're there ready to inspire and to build uh, changes for quality and safety in healthcare worldwide. And we do this by giving knowledge and we have programs and conferences and building networks just like we're doing today and also giving people a voice to speak. What I'm really going to talk about is the impact of the last uh, 15 months of COVID uh, on how it has been a wake-up call 
for us. It is a time for change. Uh, people often think about going back to uh, the old normal. And when you think of the old normal, I think of the sunset uh, over Cartagena when I was last in Colombia uh, about uh, 18 months ago, uh, just over two years ago, I think now for the close time. And this is the beauty of the sunset of, of in Cartagena. And it is easy for us to think that the old normal was this tranquil. However, the old normal wasn't that great either. It was much like this, very stormy. And why do I say that? Because we had patient harm. And you're going to hear a lot about how we plan to decrease patient harm. You have person and unfriendly care. Uh, you've heard a lot about that. On, uh, uh, going on and it's still a problem. And it was really what has shown us right now with COVID that we were quite age unfriendly because the mortality rate has been very high in the elderly. Uh, we hadn't paid much attention to healthcare worker safety. And I know my friend Steve has been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, I'm not sure if he's gonna say anything about it, but healthcare worker safety wasn't the highest priority that we had. And of course, many healthcare workers have suffered during the pandemic. We had wide variation in the quality of our care. So uh, there were some places that are good and excellent and others not. And we were very inefficient. We waste a lot of our resources. And what COVID has really also determined uh, for us that there were structural inequalities that we had accepted and that the social determinants of health were very important. And as we reflect on the outcome, we're going to see that these are the issues that we're going to have to deal with going forward. Because in terms of patient safety, the structural inequalities uh, really paid a big uh, impact on that. So why are we surprised at the outcome of the lack of preparedness that we had? And why is it that we have so much difficulty in implementation. We know what you do, but why is it that it's difficult to do it? So this lot got me thinking whether the problem is deeper uh, and whether despite the fact that we know about the technical uh, interventions that we have to do, how do we manage to do them and how can we deliver respectful care. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. One of the key things is that the solution is not an easy one because we have to sit back and reflect on how we have constructed the delivery of health care and whether it is not the right model and we are not delivering health. So we need to think a little differently. While there has been some success, we have yet to achieve safety. We have made a lot of strides since, 90, since uh, uh, the turn of the century when this really started on the journey of patient safety. And I take you back two years ago to these three reports, which were on lower middle income countries, but were really a mirror for the upper income countries and the middle income countries as well. Uh, one from the World Health Organization, OECD and World Bank, the one from the National Academies and then the one from the Lancet Global Commission. And many of you may have been part of these, these reports. And basically what they came up with was that there were 8 million deaths from unsafe or poor quality care worldwide every year. And of course that's an underestimate because they didn't look at every, every circumstance. And of course this number must have gone up in the last year as well. Now, I don't want to forget these reports because they're very valuable and they came out with many recommendations. And as you can see, I've summarized them on this slide. Uh, universal healthcare, accountability systems thinking, measurement, new technologies as such as digital health. It's quite interesting that they came up stating that's what we had to do. And lo and behold, when we had the pandemic, digital health suddenly took off and there were new technologies we had to do. And beforehand, they were quite resistant in, in, in implementing some things like telemedicine, 
which we did as a reaction rather than as what we wanted to do. So that's one of the positives that came out of COVID that we were managed to make breakthroughs in two of these areas very quickly. And also looking at the informal sector as partners and how we manage health and health care. Then there are these three uh, different uh, articles. One uh, is from uh, the group from the uh, Lucy Lee Foundation and you can see on reporting on the safety progress report that was in 2018. And then David Bates, you're going to hear from wrote this paper on assessing the progress after uh, to, as human 20 years on. And then the book came out more or less the same time from um, Kathleen Sutcliffe and Rob Weirs. And basically saying that we have made a lot of progress but we're still not safe. So we do know what to do. They came up with some recommendations and these are the five recommendations from the Gandhi paper about needing to educate the future generations and the current generation uh, work workforce on patient safety, integrating our care, which is redesigning the way we do care, which is very siloed. Looking after the psychological and physical health uh, safety of the healthcare worker, uh, which is essential. And I think that is something we learned to our detriment that we weren't doing that as well as we should have during the pandemic. And then having the patients as partners in co-producing health and working in transparency. So these were the recommendations that came out. And then at the beginning of last year, there was another set of recommendations that came out from the United States. And I think that uh, the National Action Plan, uh, Safer Together, and I put it there because there are a lot of good things in this document that you can adapt for yourselves and make more contextually, but they came up with very similar kind of recommendations. The importance of culture and leadership and good governance involving the patients, then workforce safety, as you can see prophetically saying just before the pandemic, we need to look at workforce safety and then developing a learning system and one of the advantages of the pandemic has been the rapid learning systems that have been involved that have turned our idea of learning on its head, but also comes with the danger of not knowing what is good evidence and what is poor evidence. And we are learning how to learn much quicker and faster than before. So if you put this in your context, you can then start looking at some of the uh, theories that we like to use in patient safety. And I'm going to give two of them, which you may hear about later on as well. The first one is from Pascal Carrion and her team, the SEEPS model, which is taking a human factors approach. One of the problems we have in healthcare is that we have not adopted human factors as one of the key ingredients of what we do. And it should be something that should be central to all we do based on the Donabedium concept of systems and processes leads to outcome. You first need to know how to examine your work system, which is your organization, the environment, the people, the technology, and the tasks. And I think that if you apply this constantly day in, day out, you can really make a big difference because when you understand the work system, you then get to understand the processes that lead to the desired or undesired outcomes and which can feed back to the work system. So this is uh, the, the uh, SEEPS model, which is something that provides an easy to understand human factors framework for clinical teams is essential for us to adopt going forward. And then you hear about high reliability, how important it is. And these come from, again, from Week and Sutcliffe. This is the five elements of high reliability. And I put into the red, you can see the importance of the sensitivity to operations uh, and the commitment to resilience and deference to expertise. So these five elements of high reliability organizations, which uh, have been demonstrated to work and to make a difference if you apply to them, are very important going forward. So the human factors theory and the high reliability theory together can help us go forward. However, I have really put the two key areas where I think we need to work in red, how we can really pay attention what's happening to the front line. And this is where I'm going to concentrate for the rest of the talk. 
we need to address what I call the core issues, which is for people to be safe, they have to feel safe. And we need to really consider what are we doing to ensure that the workforce may know what to do, but they feel safe in doing it. So I was thinking on some of the things that I, I have learned over the past few years, and this comes from an article from uh, Richard Burma, who, uh, who from Harvard, who wrote about the four habits of high performing organizations. Now, when you look at this, this comes from Duran's trilogy of planning and prepare, uh, and I put preparedness uh, of having the infrastructure and management, uh, quality management, having measurements and controls and having learning and improvements. Uh, I think that these four habits are what we really want to aspire to as we build our safe systems. We have to really plan it and we really have to have good management of safety. And then of course, measurement is essential. Now, if I look at this and how we're going to learn and improve, I think that there are two other habits that have to add to this from our experience over the past uh, few months. The first one is this habit of kindness. Uh, it's quite interesting that this concept of kindness, which has been around for some time, is coming to the fore right now as we are trying to deal with the inputs of this pandemic. So that for me is the fifth habit that we have to engender in order to be safe and have high quality care. And the sixth habit is the habit of respect. This is being able to give respect and they're able to receive respect. I, I've been in the healthcare business a long time, for a long time, my whole career. And what it seems to me as I reflect back on, on our healthcare, we have a lot of examples of lack of respect. So primary care to secondary care, secondary care then says, what is primary care doing? Uh, uh, we get to secondary care to tertiary care, the same question gets asked within tertiary care, there are different hierarchies of respect, and often we don't even respect the patient, and we don't respect their families. And this concept of respect is something that is difficult to do, but something that we need to look at very carefully. So respect and kindness are essential. So how do we do this? Well, we need to move forward to looking at the energy for improvement. And if you look at the work of Helen Bevan in England, she came up with some of these ideas, which I thought were very interesting. We need to now link into the imagination of our staff to get them engaged. And imagine means that you go in beyond what you have already. So in order to be safe, we have to imagine beyond what we have. And that opens up a whole new way of participation of keeping people together and moving to new solutions rather than going back to the old ones. We also have to consider the mobilization theory of social movements. Why is it that climate change has such a wide social mobility whereas patient safety doesn't have it? So can we learn from them to get to a call to action? Uh, as you know, this year uh, is going to be the launch of the the decade of patient safety and WHO has a, uh, is going to, at the World Health Assembly, I think, will approve the, the WHO uh, patient safety actions. Uh, and I think that this is a call to action to all of us to make a difference. And to do that, you have to go beyond the technical. We know a lot of what to do, but now we have to find a way to get people to do it. So, as I was thinking about this talk, I went back to uh, Dr. Edwards Deming, who, uh, who's the, the founder of, of a lot of the theory and quality improvement. And I looked at these 14 principles because actually when you look at the principles that he has, it helps us define what we have to do as we build respect and build the new systems. We have to have constancy of purpose. Uh, you might hear later from Steve about the concepts of 
constancy of purpose they have at Cincinnati, we have to adopt a new thinking. So he was, Deming's thinking was a new thinking of management, and we have to have the new thinking of patient safety, of doing things differently. We have to understand that inspection is not the way forward. We have to move beyond inspection. And we have to think, I was thinking about this issue of the single supplier. And this is uh, in a hospital where there's maybe many different types of pumps or ventilators or equipment. And we have to move to type of unifying and standardizing what we do. We have to make improvements as a constant and train people on the job. When I look at these, these are quite prophetic. The next one is about leadership, where leadership is there to make a difference and to ensure that people are treated in such a way that we cannot have fear and blame, but rather build on their pride. And that this next one is about breaking down silos. And this is so essential because as you can see earlier on in the patient safety one, they said we need to integrate, which is breaking down silos and eliminating slogans. So a slogan like zero harm is great, but it is not really going to get anywhere unless we empower people to make a change and eliminate targets and give them pride in their work. So this will require education. So I think that these 14 principles that were written by Dr. Deming are so apt for the way forward in healthcare as we move to be safe. All of this means we have to work together to transform. And that is the challenge we have going forward. So looking at what's going on right now, translating those 14 principles, Helen Bevan uh, from the UK and Goran Henriks from Yon Shipping are doing a series of blogs in the BMJ leader to answer seven points of simple rules for leaders. So I, I thought I'd uh, take it off, off them and really share it with you. And you can see a lot of these are similar to what Deming says, shared purpose, sense of belonging, uh, really starting early on in the intervention. I'm going to talk a bit about giving people power, agency, embracing the complexity of what we do, learning, and then having change. So these are the simple rules for leaders. And I really recommend that you look at BMJ Leader at the blogs because they are looking every month at one of them. And they're now up to, I think, the third or fourth one. So to come on with this, this concept of kindness, Paul Batalden and uh, Chris Van Hex and I recently published this article in an experimental way to get comments as we build in ideas of what it must look like in the future. So just as you've heard about safety one, safety two, we also talk about quality one, two, and three. And we need all of them. Quality one in, in bread is building thresholds, standards, evaluation. Quality two, is looking at um, how we build reliability. And that's where we're really working on. And as we look at going forward, we have to say we have to be beyond building reliability, which is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So this is where we think that we need to go to co-production of health, and in our case, here, co-production of safety. The ownership of health and safety involves a kinship and integration of what we do in order to create value. So this is a concept that we had to take. And then we started to look at what will this mean? So it means that we look at the six domains of quality and there you can see safety right at the top. And how do we change this? Well, person-centered care becomes, surrounds everything. It's not a domain of quality, it is quality, but it has to have everything else. And we need to be eco-friendly as well. And to do that, we then need to move to the core values that we have, which is kindness, respect, holistic care, and co-production of solutions. And this is based in a system of transparency. So we think that this is the way we need to look forward. And then safety requires this core values of kindness, respect, and holistic care with co-production. So how do we do it? Well, 
physical safety requires psychological safety. And as Hallnagel says, we have to provide safety under expected and unexpected conditions. So to do that, we have to ensure that we have psychological safety of our staff. And the psychological safety is shown here as the differences between psychological danger, fear of making mistakes, uh, less likely to share different views, to psychological safety where you comfort making mistakes, you're learning constantly from failure, everyone shares ideas and better innovation. Uh, you might say this fits in with the human factors and the high reliability theory, but psychological safety is, although we've known it for about a long time, it's now become very prominent as the next phase of what we really have to do. And we have to look at where we are in our own organizations. Are we in the learning zone or the apathy zone or the anxiety zone or just in comfort? Where do we actually, where are we and where are our staff? And this is something that now COVID has shown that we really have to pay attention to. We have to give people a sense of meaning, why they are doing their work, why it's important and what they need to do. They need to feel that they are heard. We have to be able to share person stories, not only patient stories, but provider stories as well. And that will help us understand how to keep people safe. We need to give people the sense of belonging. Now, uh, it, is, uh, it is something hard to think about what this really is, uh, because it's not that tangible. But in teams, which is a sense of meaning and belonging and purpose, there's likely to be better safety and psychological safety. So what they say is really, we need to look at the climate, we need to look at the leadership, we need to look at the practice of what we do, and that will give us the belonging, giving people perspective of where they're working and feedback. And the work of Amy Edmondson on psychological safety, which has come out to the fore in the last few years, has really put to us the importance of giving people a respect and kindness in order to be safe. I, I, when they talked about agency, I went and started to look at this idea of agency, which comes a lot from the mental health work. And this is about people having ownership and as people in the front line having control and ownership and feeling that they're able to make a difference. So all of this is what people call the soft skills, but they're actually the very hard skills it's easy to learn how to do a bundle of care, which is part of reliability, but how do you get people to do it if you do not empower them to do so? So if you look at the, uh, the safety model, this comes from James Reason, uh, and adapting it to the psychological safety, you can see as you go up the hierarchy of safety to generative where you are already safe, it's at this point of systematic where you're counting a lot, you have systems in place where the tipping point happens. And that tipping point is psychological safety is where you work where safety becomes your business rather than something you do when something goes wrong. And it's very interesting to see how you can adapt this hierarchy of safety in order to ensure that we move up this to get to this generative case where safety is our business. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about what this really means. In essence, it means a transfer of power. It's the power that the leadership has. They have to move it to the power of ownership in the front line to enable people to do this. And to do that, you have to look after their psychological safety and you do that with kindness and respect. And that means you have to give deference to the expertise of the people. And by people, we, are, we mean the people we call healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, clinicians of any type, and then the people who we call patients, because they are people before they are patients and before they're healthcare workers. So giving deference to the expertise of the people takes us back to the human factors and the high reliability theory. So building resilience, will require a number of issues that we have to take. 
And this comes from Charles Vincent's uh, uh, study on how to measure patient safety. And we've adapted this in order to have clinical teams own safety in the front line and constantly assess it. So how we've done it, we say every day they should be asking what have we done well, because that builds resilience, that builds respect, and they're giving everyone a chance to have a voice to say, this is what we did well. And in real time, they can then say over the past few hours, have we harmed anyone? How can we prevent it? Because often that will mean that they have to define the type of risks. And as Alma Berti and Vincent say, you have to proactively manage risk, not retrospectively. So we're looking at the past harm on a daily basis so they can manage and decrease it. They then look at the reliability of their care. Are we doing what we're supposed to do? And if not, why not? And how can we do it better? You then go on to the sensitivity of the operations that's applying the SEEPS model and looking at how the work system is working at that time in real time, looking at what's going to happen in the future, the prediction rather than reaction. So as Elmer Berti and Vincent say, you have to predict the future in order to be able to manage what is going to happen and decrease risk. And then finally, how you can learn and how we can have learning systems. Now, when I think about uh, the COVID pandemic and what has happened over the past uh, 14 months, I think that if we had equipped our clinical teams with this framework and had treated them with kindness, we would have seen very good results. And we have to really think about how we can manage this going forward. So in conclusion, I return to Deming's 14 principles, which you see here. And these principles are really very relevant today and they carry on forward in our quality sphere as well as in our patient safety sphere. So I'd like to thank you for listening to me and invite you to uh, the virtual ISPRA conference, which is in uh, supposed to be in Florence, but as we are now, we're going to be virtual on the 8th to 11th of July. You can, uh, you can uh, register right now and we've made it as ready as uh, reasonable as possible these are the, uh, the fees. If you lower middle income, it's much less than this, but it's ready to make it possible. And I'd like to thank you very much. Please do not hesitate to contact me and I'm open for questions now. Thanks very much. Muchas gracias al doctor Peter Lagman por su excelente presentación. Eh, no tenemos considerado darle paso a preguntas por la cantidad de preguntas que nos están llegando. Vamos a darle paso inmediatamente a la conferencia de la doctora Sonali Desai. Adelante, doctora Desai. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you sí, so much. Bien for having me here today. I will be talking about our quality and safety approach at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And I will be joined by Dr. Bates who will be giving us an overview of quality and safety as well. So over the next 20 minutes, I will be providing you with an overview of our department of quality and safety, including goals, structure and approaches. And then I will be going deeper into our ambulatory patient safety program. So at Brigham and Women's Hospital, we are approximately a 753 bed inpatient hospital with also 166 ambulatory practices. In our Department of Quality and Safety, we have patient safety, risk management, compliance, and a bunch of other teams that work together to provide quality and safety for our organization. Some of our key goals over 2021 include patient experience, 
health equity, mortality, infection prevention, as well as several other domains. And we have the idea of creating high reliability approaches to promote quality and safety across our organization. In order for us to do this, we have created a couple of structures, including what we call unit-based teams and domain teams. And what these are, are we take our hospital strategy and goals, which I mentioned earlier, and we create domain-specific teams, which are focused on particular areas, for example, health equity, harm reduction, infection prevention, et cetera. We then develop unit-based teams, which consist of local leadership at the unit level. So for example, a medical director and a nursing director on a particular med medicine unit. And then together, we work with these unit-based teams, as well as our Department of Quality and Safety, to improve clinical outcomes through both operations and quality and safety. Thus far, we have about 22 inpatient unit-based teams that are operational, with many more on the way. We have a larger governance structure, which we call active asset management, which oversees all of these unit-based teams. And as you can see here, they're broken down into different departments, such as OBGYN, surgery, medicine. And then with the, within those, we have specific unit-based teams that are comprised of the local leadership. We have found the structure to be quite effective in helping us to achieve both our operational as well as our quality and safety goals. Another approach that we take uh, is collaborative case reviews. So when we think about the different types of safety events that are brought to our attention within our organization, we used to conduct what are called root cause analyses, which are probably very familiar to all of you. But we have then switched to more of a collaborative case review model of care. And approximately four to five years ago, we were really only doing 20 to 25 uh, root cause analyses per year. But over the past couple of years, we've really increased the volume of these reviews and are doing over 100 per year. And the differences between the collaborative case reviews and the prior root cause analyses are that we assess and manage system influences on human performance, as well as personal influences on human performance. And by looking at cases through both of these lenses, we're able to create multiple action items that result from each of our cases that are brought to our attention. And for each of these cases, we generate multiple action items, which then are tracked very closely to completion. You can see in 2019, we had an almost 80% completion rate of our action items, which of course was lower in 2020 in the context of the COVID pandemic. But when we have difficulty achieving closure on our action items, we work very closely with our hospital leadership, including our senior vice presidents across the different departments to achieve closure. Now I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about specifically ambulatory care and safety risk. In our ambulatory care setting, care is provided by many different providers. It is spread out over time and therefore errors may not be immediately obvious or identified by our clinicians. We have written about this over the past several years with specific initiatives. One is called closing the loop with ambulatory staff on safety reports. And the other is called building an ambulatory safety program within an academic health system. And it was really critical for us to first think about how we change the culture of our organization in the ambulatory setting by focusing on safety reports and providing feedback to staff when they asked for feedback. And we actually found that less than 50% of the time did our staff actually want feedback, but we were able to achieve this in 90% of cases when people did want feedback. We've also been able to develop an ambulatory safety team, which is comprised of myself as the medical director, as well as a, a pharmacist, a project manager, a project coordinator, and a patient navigator. And together we work across our ambulatory practices to try to improve patient safety. And as we think about patient safety in the ambulatory setting, we often think about where failures in the diagnostic process can occur. And when we think about how a patient engages with our healthcare system, it really depends when they first experience symptoms. And then we go into this loop of the diagnostic process where we try to gather information, integrate it, develop a working diagnosis, communicate with the patient and family effectively, and ultimately establish a treatment plan. But as you can see, there are many places along this chain where failures can occur. 
And so what we've tried to do over the past several years is develop what we call safety net programs. Safety net programs really help to prevent missed and delayed diagnosis of cancer by putting the correct systems in place to make sure that these abnormal test results follow a closed loop process. Often test results can get overlooked or forgotten given the high volume and clinical burden um, that our clinicians are facing. So these safety nets comprised of three major components. The first is data, so we can establish a set of patients that are at risk that we need to follow, workflow changes at the practice level, and tracking and outreach. When we designed these programs, we had a couple of key principles that we wanted to make sure we adhered to. And that first principle was to alleviate clinician burnout. We wanted to be sure that when we put systems in place, our clinicians would not be burdened further with additional work to do. And in, in fact, we would be alleviating some of that cognitive load. We also collaborated very closely with existing programs and structures. So for example, our scheduling teams, our specialty teams, our result generating areas, our primary care practices, we worked very closely with these groups to develop these safety net teams. We also worked on interventions that we thought had high impact, addressed high risk and leveraged technology. We currently have uh, several safety net programs in place, which include colon cancer, lung cancer and radiology results, prostate cancer and medication safety. We are in the process of launching programs for cervical cancer, as well as diagnostic errors in COVID. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome Dr. Bates. Um, we just got started early and so we just flipped the order of our presentation. So the first safety net program that I will dive into is our colon cancer safety net program. And again, what we're thinking about in this safety net is we're looking at patients who have had a colonoscopy procedure at our organization and who are now due to come back in for follow-up. Often that follow-up occurs three, five, seven years down the line. And so we wanted to design a system that would accurately identify these patients. So we created an electronic registry within our electronic health record system. We then have a project manager who runs that registry, identifies patients and conducts manual chart review to ensure that they don't in fact have follow in place. She then communicates directly with the clinicians involved in their care, including both primary care and gastroenterology. And she also reaches out to the patients themselves to explain to them why it's important to come in. We then have patients scheduled with our endoscopy staff and we make sure that all of these patients get the care that they need. What we found over the past several years as we've been working on this was we first started by sending letters to patients. That didn't really have as much of an impact as we had hoped. So once we hired a patient navigator, we had this navigator conduct phone calls and send letters. And through those efforts, we found that combination to be quite effective and we've completed almost 550 colonoscopies at this point. Now remember, these safety net systems are working in conjunction with our usual care. So we have many other programs that help patients to come back for their colonoscopies. And this is an additional safety net or layer that we have in place. We've described this in a manuscript in the Joint Commission Journal a couple of years ago, which gives a lot more detail on how to design these types of programs with a specific focus on the colon cancer safety net. Next, I wanted to shift gears and talk about our radiology safety net programs. This program is called Addressing Radiology Results Collaboratively, or ARC. And I think it's always helpful to start with a specific case of a patient to provide context for why these programs are so important. This was a patient, and what you can see on the left-hand side is a chest X-ray, where this patient came to our organization with a headache. That was their main symptom. They also had a cough. The patient ended up coming to our hospital, having neurosurgical procedures, having a complicated stay, et cetera. And in the process of all of that, although this result was initially noticed by the emergency room team, by the time the patient left and had primary care, even within our system, they ended up coming back about 18 months later with a much enlarged lung cancer that was at that point metastatic. And I'm sure many of you have had these types of cases across your organization, but this case in particular went to our board quality committee for our hospital and really spurred us into action to try to develop a high reliability system to prevent these types of cases. And so again, similar to the colon cancer safety net, what we did is we got together with our primary care colleagues, our radiologists, and we developed a system that would help to mitigate this risk. And so let me just show you how it works in real practice. 
So what happens is when the radiologist is doing their uh, review and looking at the CAT scan or the chest X-ray, they now are very specific in determining wh when this patient needs to come back and with which modality, CAT scan or chest, chest X-ray. And they create an electronic alert. This electronic alert is then sent to the ordering clinician, both through our email system, as well as through our electronic medical record where we see two red exclamation points highlighting this result in our in-basket. And then once we get this email, we click on the hyperlink, and this is what we see. We see the screen that is already auto-populated with these three buttons that says, I agree with the follow-up recommendation, and please send this uh, report directly to the radiology central scheduling team who will then help to schedule the patient. We also put a caveat that we don't want the scheduling team to call our patient for at least a week to give the doctor a chance to call the patient and explain the result. And as we went live with the system, we find that about 80 to 85% of the time, most clinicians will just agree with the radiologist's follow-up recommendation. We also have the option though, however, to say that this is not necessary. So if there's a radiology finding that the ordering clinician feels is not necessary, you can indicate that very easily in the system. And then once you do that, nothing else will happen down the road for this patient. And that happens about 10 to 15% of the time. We also have the option of modifying the alert. About two to 3% of the time, the clinician will modify the alert. And maybe you know something additional about the patient's risk. So you will say, maybe this patient needs a scan earlier than when the radiologist recommended. And then lastly, we also have an option to transfer the alert. So let's say that Dr. Bates has ordered a study and it's something that I would be perhaps best suited to follow up on. He can transfer the alert to me, I can accept it, and then I can take uh, care of following up on that particular finding and take responsibility for it. So how does this all happen? How do we really make sure that these tests get followed up? Well, we have a working group that is comprised of three different teams. One team is our safety net team, which reports to me, and we conduct manual chart reviews, we communicate with providers, and we send letters to patients and our outside clinicians with these specific findings. We also have a radiology operations team that does all of our data tracking and dashboards and also does feedback with radiologists to improve the quality of their recommendations. And as well, we have a radiology central scheduling team, which creates the order for the next imaging study that's required in our medical record system and also contacts patients for scheduling. And what we found as we instituted this, instituted this program, specifically around pulmonary nodules, is that our follow-up rates have really improved from 79% to almost 95% of patients getting the appropriate tests that they need. And so we've found that this has been very helpful in actually ensuring that our patients get the appropriate care. And as you can see, if we look back at the original diagnostic error model that I'd spoken about earlier, this system really helps to track many of the failure points and to alleviate those by creating a working diagnosis in collaboration with the ordering clinician and the radiologist with good communication with the patients and the outside clinicians and tracking outcomes to completion. We have published on this and this describes how the radiologists really were able to change their behavior and change the way that they do these types of follow-up tests, which was a big cultural change um, for the way that we were normally doing things in our organization. And then we've also published a paper in the Joint Commission Journal a couple of months ago, which again describes our program in lung nodules in a lot more detail. And as you can see, we're generating hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of these alerts per year. When we first started our efforts back in October of 2019, we had very small volumes of alerts being generated because we were really only focused on lung nodules. But now we're on track to have about 10,000 of these alerts per year. And so the blue represents lung nodules. And then over time, even during the COVID pandemic, we were able to expand this to many other parts of our organization, including um, breast imaging, musculoskeletal, et cetera. Next, I wanted to shift gears and tell, tell you about our prostate cancer safety net. So as you know, prostate cancer is one of our more common uh, malignancies, but often is very slow growing. And the recommendations on prostate cancer screening have changed over time. But what we've found is that even patients who have a prostate cancer specific antigen checked, if their value is abnormal, we still need to make sure that they have a follow-up plan in place. And so we were able to create a report that tracks patients with a PSA level greater than four within our primary care system. And we have about 1,100 per year. And then we've collaborated closely with our primary care colleagues, 
as well as our urology colleagues to develop a plan to track these patients to completion. And what you can see is we, we track very closely exactly what the follow-up is. Did the patient have a biopsy? Were they connected to our urology clinic? Did they actually develop prostate cancer? And as we've been working on this for about a year, year and a half, we have identified at least four patients who were diagnosed with prostate cancer who we think were directly related to some of the efforts of the safety net program. We've also received very positive feedback from our primary care colleagues who have found this to be helpful when we identify patients who really do seem to have potentially fallen through the cracks. And particularly during the COVID pandemic, when our laboratories may not have been as accessible or our office visits may not have been happening as frequently as we would have liked, it was important to have these systems in place uh, to track these patients closely. Next, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on our medication safety net. So as you all know, medication safety is a very important part of ambulatory safety risk. There are many reasons why patients may have medication errors that occur, stemming from polypharmacy, lack of medication availability, missing follow-up visits, inaccurate medication lists, and of course, transitions of care. So we have hired uh, one ambulatory medication safety pharmacist who works across our ambulatory setting. And what she's able to do is to work directly with patients to obtain a much more detailed history and medication management approach, discuss obstacles to medication adherence, observe when medications are actually being filled as opposed to when they're prescribed, and then work directly with our primary care colleagues to make changes and adjustments with the patients as needed. And so the approach we've taken is we've had our pharmacist initially sitting in two of our community health centers and doing face-to-face -face visits. As soon as the COVID pandemic hit, she shifted to telehealth visits and was conducting all of her visits over a primarily telephone, but sometimes video. And she worked specifically in two of our community health centers where we had patients with multiple comorbidities and particularly patients with um, diabetes. And to date, she's actually now been working in our practices for about a year, has seen over 500 patients. And what's interesting is the amount of time that she's been able to spend with patients. So her average visit is well over one hour with each patient, which of course exceeds most of the time that we get when we are seeing a patient in the office. And with this time and with seeing patients repeatedly, she's able to establish a connection and really identify different types of interventions, which are often things that um, are not things that we would cover in an office visit. So are the patients able to afford the medications? Are they understanding why they need to take the medications? Most of the patients are Spanish speaking, about 57% require an interpreter. And she starts her visit with the interpreter on the line to make sure that she can establish that connection with the patient. We are also in the process of developing a cervical cancer safety net. And this one is important for women's health. So women who have an abnormal pap smear or HPV testing can then go on to develop cervical cancer. And often patients will need procedures following this abnormal result. It could be a colposcopy, it could be a repeat visit with a GYN. And again, there's many points along the way where patients may not get the complete care that they need. So we are co-designing a project with our uh, GYN nurses, our primary care colleagues, and patient navigators so that we can really explain to patients why it's important to come back for follow-up, to identify barriers, particularly in our underserved communities, and then to really close those gaps and make sure again that most of our patients who require follow-up are getting it in a timely fashion. There's also been many changes to the cervical cancer screening and management guidelines, which are very complex. So we're also working on educating our clinicians to make sure they're up to speed with guidelines, as well as developing patient-friendly materials so that patients are aware of the risk. Next, I wanted to shift gear and talk about diagnostic error. This was a nice paper that came out last year at the beginning, I believe, of June, written by Tejal Gandhi and Hardeep Singh, international leaders in the field of quality and safety. And what they describe are different types of risk of diagnostic error that are specific to the COVID pandemic. And I won't go into all of these categories right now as we don't have time, but it is an interesting way to think about how the ways that we're delivering care, whether it's through telehealth, whether it's the, the strain that's put on our healthcare system, or whether patients or clinicians are delaying and deferring care, what we're going to see after the pandemic, are we gonna see more cases of delayed care, which I think we have already seen. So in the moment, what we are doing is we are applying natural language processing and informatics approaches to our safety reporting system to identify 
diagnostic errors during COVID that we may not have fully recognized and to think about how we can proactively approach this in the future. And so we're in the process of writing a manuscript on this, which hopefully will be published in the next six months or so. In addition, last year during the COVID pandemic, we also used our safety reporting system and tagged our safety reports for COVID related uh, themes so that we could then bring those issues to our hospital incident command system so that they would have a perspective on what's happening through our safety reports and changes that needed to be made from an operation standpoint could happen more effectively. So with that, I will end my time. I thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, and I will now hand it over to Dr. Bates. Bueno, muy, muy buenos días. Uh, nos, gusto, nos gusta mucho tener la posibilidad de hablar con ustedes hoy día. Uh, preferíamos estar en Colombia, uh, pero esto no fue, fue posible este año, uh, quizá el año que viene. And now I'm going to speak in uh, English uh, from here, but I just wanted to say say hello to everyone. Uh, you've heard a, a, a lot from Dr. Desai about some of the really amazing work that she's done. I'm going to talk a bit about safety inside the hospital. I'm also going to say a little bit about the impact of COVID, mostly inside the hospital, talk about the measurement of harm in the inpatient setting, and a big study that we're doing around that, and then how, how data can be used to uh, better manage improvement. Um, I'll talk about uh, the safe care study and share some preliminary findings, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, so what about, what about safety inside the hospital versus outside? Well, most of the safety research has been done on hospital populations, but much more clinical care is being done outside the hospital today. And the limited data that we have uh, suggests that the magnitude of the problem is about as big in outpatients. And as Dr. Desai just told you, there are a lot of things that we can do to make things uh, safer outside of the, the hospital, especially with the closing the loop kinds of approaches. Now, uh, when COVID started here, uh, the biggest thing that happened was that we had an incredible switch to telemedicine, which happened almost overnight. We actually stopped seeing pe people face to face and started to see, see virtually everyone uh, virtually. And uh, this was a huge uh, change for us. And even inside the hospital, we tried to minimize contact between staff and patients. And we gave patients uh, devices so that they could interact with staff and we could minimize the, the uh, amount of time that, that staff was having to spend with infected patients. Uh, here are a few uh, 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 specific examples of changes during, during COVID, specifically that related to information technology. Uh, I mentioned the switch to tele telemedicine. Uh, we also just started managing all our chronic diseases remotely. Uh, there was some increased use of wearables because that helped us monitor things that were hard to, to uh, monitor. We had major problems with lab, uh, lab testing uh, early on. There was a need for rapid changes in our decision support in the computer, but we couldn't really make the changes at the beginning with the speed needed by uh, clinicians. Uh, one positive was that we really expedited clinical research. We did that much faster than we'd done uh, normally. Uh, there was a rapid release of tools that allowed tracking of patients in ICUs, and that was pretty beneficial. There was early release of ICU data, which we don't usually, uh, we hadn't usually done in the in the past. Uh, there were some privacy and confidentiality concerns around tracking data using smartphones. Uh, there was a lot of concern about how rapidly, how to rapidly uh, disseminate health information to the general public in ways that would result in behavior change, in particular to get people to wear masks. It was so hard to do that at the beginning, especially in some parts of our, our country. Uh, there were a lot of problems for parents, especially women who are working in medicine, who are now at home with children and trying to work from home. Uh, and it's not really clear, I would say so far, as to what the overall impact on safety was. Uh, Dr. Desai, again, shared some, some thoughts with you about that. And I think some aspects of safety undoubtedly were damaged, but we, we still don't know as much about that as, as we would like to. 
So then next, I'm going to just talk about the safe care study, which is a big study that we're doing now. Um, and the, the backdrop is that uh, we first found out about the magnitude of the problem of safety in the inpatient setting through the Harvard Medical Practice Study. That was a study that was done uh, 30 years ago now. And it was done in New York State, one state. And uh, records were reviewed and, and the number of patients who were harmed were counted up. But so many things have changed since then. So first of all, that care is much more team-based and it's more patient-oriented. There's a, a focus on, on, uh, on prevention and, and care in the outpatient setting. Uh, in the US now, 98% of hospitals and 80% of physician offices are using electronic health records. Uh, it's not really clear uh, whether all these changes in technology and delivery and management and payment models have led to an overall improvement in patient safety and quality of care uh, or not. Uh, so we have a couple of aims in this study. We're doing a chart review and we're doing it uh, this time in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, we sampled a number of institutions. Uh, we're also looking at finding adverse events through, uh, through uh, uh, current routine processes for safety reporting. Uh, and then in addition, we're developing an approach for ongoing operational evaluation of harm. So uh, there's a safety metric survey, which I'll tell you about to identify what is currently being collected by institutions. Uh, we did a world cafe to solicit expert opinions about some of the val value and feasibility of metrics. And we're working on identifying new approaches to identify patient harm. Uh, some of the institutions in the study are using a, a tool made by a company called Vigilance, which electronically detects adverse events. And that's the way I think things will be done in the future. Uh, this is just a list of the sites. It's, uh, it's a large number of institutions. We included both big ones and small ones. So our hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital is included, so is Mass General. But many of these other hospitals are quite small. Um, the uh, uh, survey has been conducted over a recent one year period. We included a random sample of records uh, we use in the inpatient evaluation. We ad adapted from the inst uh, from the IHI Global Trigger Tool, and the outpatient uh, evaluation has also been adapted from the, from the outpatient uh, trigger tool. That tool is not as strong as the inpatient tool, which has been used a lot. Uh, we also use some triggers to try and pick up outpatient diagnostic errors. Dr. Desai talked about that, and adverse drug events. Those are two areas that are not typically. Uh, very well detected in the outside, in the uh, outpatient setting. And then we're using triggers to focus the record review to identify adverse events. We're also recording any other adverse events that were identified. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, uh, in, in AIM-2, we want to develop an approach that that organizations could use routinely in an ongoing way as part of their usual approach for uh, assessing the frequency of, of adverse events. Um, and we would like to eventually come up with something that allowed comparisons both within and across institutions over time. Uh, we want to use electronic data to find adverse events and identify new denominators for looking at harm. Um, and I mentioned the World Cafe. Um, in this uh, World Cafe, we, we brought safety experts together from across all these hospitals and, uh, and went through the metrics from all the different organizations that have them. And it's kind of a bewildering array. Uh, Dr. Desai has to, has to deal with this on a daily basis because we have to send information to most of these organizations uh, so that they can assess how, how uh, safe the care that we're delivering is. And that is a big burden on, uh, on institutions. Um, when we had the World Cafe, we reached consensus on most metrics. Um, metrics in every domain could be narrowed from a long list. Uh, we did uh, determine that some of the metrics weren't clinically important and those were just left out. But um, we still had 218 uh, clinically important metrics amenable to chart review and 119 clinically important metrics uh, amenable to electronic extraction. That is a lot of uh, metrics. Uh, and then there were a number of ideas about where one could go in the future. 
Now, uh, the next thing we did was to go to a number of institutions and just ask them, oh, what are you collecting? And the key finding here was there's huge variation in terms of which uh, organizations are collecting which measures. The agreement among sites for these measures was quite low. The kappa is just uh, 0.2, which is not very good. Uh, and between the big, big hospitals, it was a little higher at 0.27. And same thing for the major teaching hospitals, but still uh, not very good. There's lots of, of, uh, of room for disagreement about what you should actually collect. Um, we uh, um, then uh, uh, looked at, at comparing three sources of patient adverse event data. We looked at adverse events through the safe care. So these are patients who had an inpatient or outpatient encounter in 2018. Uh, there's a random sample in which we did chart review and we did about 2,800 inpatient charts, 3,000 outpatient charts. Um, and we're also, as I mentioned, looking at adverse events through, uh, through both uh, voluntary safety reporting and then, and then also uh, 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 detection through vigilance. Now, uh, where I think we'll wanna go in the future is, uh, is kind of in, in this direction. And this is an idealized figure from uh, a paper by Eric Topol about uh, artificial intelligence. And here, the idea that's being presented is that we'll eventually have something that's like a, a virtual coach that will look at a patient in a whole array of ways, and then uh, we'll get some suggestions about what the, the doctor uh, should, actually, should actually do. And some of the factors that would be included would be uh, uh, genomic information and uh, family history and, and so on and so forth. Um, we recently published a, a paper in NPJ Digital Medicine, which is one of the nature journals on, on, uh, on the use of IT applications and, and, uh, and using artificial intelligence and machine learning to, uh, to um, uh, reduce harm and what, what their potential benefit might be. Um, and on, on the right is a list of some of the things that we, uh, that we looked at. Um, now, these are the main types of harm that occur in the, in the hospital. Uh, uh, Hospital-acquired infections are, are arguably the most important. They have high consequences. Uh, we felt that the potential for artificial intelligence and machine learning was moderate, mostly because there are already very good solutions like, uh, like some of the bundles that have been very effective in preventing uh, those infections. Uh, for adverse drug events, we thought uh, that there's a uh, high potential, but mostly for predicting which patients are at specific risk of which kinds of adverse drug events. So you might be able to get some suggestions about uh, avoiding a medication in a given patient. For deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, we thought uh, that there's only moderate potential, mostly because there's already great benefit with known solutions. And the key thing is just implementing those known solutions. Uh, for surgical uh, injuries, we, we felt that even though the consequences are high, the potential for AI and machine learning was, was uh, just modest. Uh, for pressure ulcers, um, they have slightly less consequences than some of these other things, but there's huge potential benefit of machine learning in this, in this area. Uh, especially if, if we can get some sensing information to detect things like, like wetness, which, uh, which are becoming available uh, now. They're actually already on the market. Uh, for falls, we thought the potential benefit was moderate because known approaches are already uh, quite helpful. And then there are a couple of new types. Uh, decompensation, uh, where the potential is uh, very high because our current approaches for finding people who are decom decompensating don't work so well. And for misdiagnoses, which uh, again, as Dr. Desai underscored, is a really difficult problem and one that we've, uh, that we've struggled with. So I just wanna drill down a little bit on decompensation because it's, it's a problem that has been a hard one for a long time. Um, um, there's been some attention to this. Uh, there, the usual approach that's used, at least in the US, is rapid response teams but that overall hasn't been very effective, especially outside of intensive care units. 
And some of the uh, opportunities improvement include detection of decompensation overall and for specific reasons like sepsis or bleeding. So uh, some of the key use cases are early identification of some, a patient who's decompensating, uh, early identification of sepsis, uh, early identification of, of a patient who's bleeding, especially post-operatively, and then decompensation in a variety of different uh, clinical settings. Uh, for sepsis, there's some concrete examples of things that are already working. Uh, the Hospital Corporation of America has developed a real-time tool, which they call SPOT, um, which has been used now in about two and a half million uh, patients. And they estimate that they've saved about 8,000 lives uh, by using this over five years. Uh, Duke has a system called Sepsis Watch, which was trained on 50,000 patients, and it has 30 million uh, data points. And there are lots of other organizations doing good work in this uh, particular area. Um, I do want to note that there are lots of other causes of harm, uh, but these are the biggest causes of harm, especially in, in uh, the hospital. Um, we focused in this review more on in the inpatient setting than in the outpatient setting, and the outpatient setting deserves more attention. Uh, many of the areas that are not traditionally considered safety issues like decompensation are on the border, but they represent really big opportunities to improve outcomes. Um, I do think it will help to have better measurement of both inpatient and outpatient safety routinely, uh, especially outpatient safety. And at the end of the day, uh, two, I think patient engagement will play a big role. Uh, we just did a study in which we showed patients their own risk for safety events. Um, people were nervous about doing that, but patients actually really liked it and felt felt better uh, uh, doing it. We, and we actually had even had a little trouble getting the IRB to allow us to to uh, to do this, but it but it worked well. So. Um, at the end of the day, there are a few uh, overarching lessons around getting benefit from artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, the first is that making good predictions isn't the hard part. There are lots of good approaches to generating good predictions. Um, and it's probably more important to use a model to predict things than versus which one you use. Um, second, picking good use cases is critical. It should match your clinical need. If you have a very high rate of problems with infections, maybe, maybe that's what you should uh, uh, pick. Uh, it might be which therapy you should pick versus identifying uh, a diagnosis. Uh, you do want to have a gap between your, your actual performance and what the ideal is. And the most important thing is getting suggestions to the right clinician at the right time. Um, the program that Dr. Desai developed has just been a model in that regard because um, the suggestions come to you after you've seen someone and an abnormal laboratory finding or a radiograph comes back. And, uh, and uh, when one of those things comes back, it, it's almost always something that you as a doctor wanna know about. Uh, broadly, our clinicians are overwhelmed with suggestions now and the last thing they want is more. Uh, you do need the ability to find the right clinician and that can be tricky. Uh, you often need to do it in real time. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition, I think we should be leveraging artificial intelligence and behavioral economics techniques to, to try and improve behavior and, uh, and leverage uh, what has been learned about kind of making things work. Um, so what is it going to take to transform care in terms of safety? Well, the first thing is it's essential to measure your performance in an ongoing way. Another key uh, issue is making your essential processes more reliable. Uh, you heard about closing the loop again from Dr. Desai, but there are approaches like computer order entry and barcoding. Uh, checklists uh, do work. They work for central line infections. They work for ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, they work as uh, for, uh, for surgical checklists in the operating room. At the end of the day, I think we will likely need dozens of checklists and clinicians are going to need help uh, remembering all those. And of course, culture is also uh, pivotal. If you don't have good safety culture, it's very hard to make a difference with any of these. So uh, to wrap up, I think safety is only going to become more important over time. 
in the US, the federal government is going to likely push for more tracking of adverse events. I expect that to happen uh, in other parts of the world too. Um, we're going to a payment arrangement called accountable care. And under accountable care, there will be strong financial incentives to reduce adverse event rates. Um, telehealth, I think, is uh, certain to advance. And there's a lot of decisions that need to be made about that. Uh, and COVID has created many uh, challenges. Um, the overall direction going forward, I think, in terms of that, will be to treat patients in the safest location for them. And I will stop there. And, uh, and perhaps we have time for a few questions. Muchas gracias, Dr. Debbie Bates, de nada. Por, su, por su excelente presentación. Vamos ahora a presentar una información de interés para todos ustedes para antes de darle paso al Dr. Mutin. Adelante con la información. Hello all, uh, I'm Steve Muthing, and I'm so honored to be here. I want to thank the organizers, uh, both for inviting me uh, to be on this panel, but also for so much help in preparing for today. I wish I was there with you, uh, but of course this is the best we can do these days. And then I also want to thank um, my fellow panelists, Dr. Bates and Dr. Desai, that was fascinating and, uh, um, the work you're doing at Brigham and Women's and really spreading all over the nation and beyond is amazing. And also want to thank Dr. Lockman uh, for his presentation. It really sets mine up well. Um, what I want to share today in the time I have is the story of our journey towards zero harm, uh, partly at Cincinnati Children's, but really what has now become a national journey with all the children's hospitals. I'm really not going to be sharing new theory. And in reality, what I'm going to be doing is talking about how we've taken a lot of the theories shared by the previous panelists and, and trying to put them into place at Cincinnati Children's and beyond. It is not a story that says we have achieved zero harm. It's a story of an organization and, uh, and then many organizations that are on the path towards zero harm. And I hope it's helpful to all of you and uh, you will find things that are useful for your organizations. I, I certainly welcome questions now or feel free to contact me. I'll have my uh, uh, contact information at the end. So with that said, let me introduce myself a, a, a little beyond just my name. Uh, again, I'm Steve Muthing. Probably most importantly, I'm a father, a husband, and a grandfather. Actually, uh, proudly, I can tell you, we just had another grandbaby born last night in Texas. So uh, I'm a very lucky man. Uh, but Relevant to today's talk, I'm a pediatrician. I have been for a number of years, over 30 years. As part of our organization's journey, I switched from general practice and then hospital medicine to focusing on improvement quality, and then eventually safety. I took on the role of safety officer for our organization 15 years ago, served in that role for 10 years. Now I lead all of our quality and safety work leading something called the Anderson Center, which is our hub for all of our quality safety work for both Cincinnati Children's and really now nationally as we work closely with all the children's hospitals. And I've been involved in so much of this work. Uh, so again, uh, I'm sharing both 
I think progress, but also where we still have work to do. Really no significant disclosures, although I always like to be transparent. I do receive some salary support from a learning network called Solutions for Patient Safety, which I'll talk about. It's a learning network, a safety learning network for what has now become just about every children's hospital in the United States and Canada. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that because I'm gonna be talking about Solutions for Patient Safety or SPS. Before I jump into our specific journey uh, that I wanna share about just a little bit more on the literature, I think the previous panelists have done an excellent job. Um, I just wanted to call out a few that I think have been meaningful for our organization as we've been trying to learn our way into this new way. Of course, uh, in the United States, so much goes back to Eris Human, uh, which is now 20 plus years ago. And then a subsequent document, Free From Harm, uh, talked about the progress and lack of progress after 15 years of To Air as Human. I encourage, if you have not had a chance to read those, I think they're incredibly insightful. And then Dr. Lockman spoke about, in the United States, a uh, national action plan that came out six months ago uh, that really tries to lay out uh, not just a theoretical uh, case for where we need to go next, but also gets into very specifics, uh, trying to help all of us find our way forward uh, toward eventually zero harm. And then I also wanted to, because I'm going to be talking about a learning network, I wanted to mention Partnership for Patients, which really got started at the federal or national level in the United States when Don Berwick was uh, in a leadership role at our, at our national government. And it was really a breakthrough attempt to bring all of the hospitals, uh, ideally together in the United States, both to share data, but probably more important to share learnings, both best practices and failures in a goal to accelerate the rate of improvement by breaking out of historical patterns of working organization by organization and, and really starting to work together. And that really was a motivation for what's happened with the children's hospitals in the United States and Canada. And then finally, I will draw your attention to the, the website for Solutions for Patient Safety, this safety learning network for all the children's hospitals. Because although we're focused on the work we're doing together uh, by sharing all of our work, which I'll get into more details on in shortly, but the other commitment we have is to share everything, share everything we've learned. So this website is a world of information, much of it specific to pediatrics, but it really speaks to the broader journey that all organizations are on toward zero harm. So that's the background on just some um, potential uh, literature and uh, sites that you might check out if my talk today um, wants you to, or leaves you wanting more. Um, so I encourage you to um, use those sites as, as you're moving forward on your journey at your organization or personally. So a little bit of background on Cincinnati Children's. Um, we're in the Midwest of uh, the United States in actually a, a small to medium sized city, but our hospital, which is a specifically for children has grown way out of proportion to what we should have in a, in a city of our size. Uh, and that has happened because although we serve the children of our region, which is about 2 million people, we also serve the nation and really the world. Um, and we've changed from really a regional children's hospital to a uh, national and global children's hospital now. But most importantly, what I wanna tell you about Cincinnati Children's is we decided a little over 20 years ago to go deep and to commit all of our resources to our quality and safety journey 
with the belief that that was our path forward. It was not going to be simply by growth or recruiting great physicians and researchers, but it was going to be to learn how to become a learning organization and improve. And that's really what led to our safety journey, which I uh, point to 15 years ago is when we really, for the first time, decided to go all in on our safety journey. And that's what I'm gonna be speaking about. A little bit more information on our organization. We're large, as I mentioned. Uh, actually, later this year, we'll be expanding to a little over 800 beds, which is um, uh, large for, obviously, for a children's hospital. As part of that, we actually have the largest mental health hospital for uh, children and, and teenagers in the United States, uh, which speaks to the terrible burden that's uh, befallen our, our country with mental health problems for kids and teens. As I mentioned, we, we take care of kids from all over. Interestingly, we also have people who work at Cincinnati Children's from almost 100 different countries, uh, which is uh, somewhat atypical for a hospital in the Midwest of the United States. But I, what I really wanna call your attention to is our vision. That's the vision we took on a little over 20 years ago when we decided to go all in on quality and then safety. Our vision is to be the leader in improving child health. And we've embraced that vision ever since. Um, we relook at it every five years, but it's never changed at all. And what we mean by that is I want to call out the fact that we're striving to be the leader. And of course, as a leader, that means you strive to be the best. We are the best probably in some things, but we are not in everything. And that's the importance of learning. And then I point to the word improving. We have a deep belief that we need to learn, we need to improve, and then we need to learn, and then we need to improve, and that that journey will never end. So as a leader, we strive to get better every day, but then we also, as a leader, believe we should share everything. We should share everything we're learning. So constantly helping everyone else at the same time we're trying to help those that we serve specifically at our organization. So that's the background on the organization, the story. So hopefully this story makes sense to you. One way to talk about our journey is simply look at the 20 years and what have we been doing? What are some key benchmarks along the way? And this is what I wanna speak to next. I'm gonna specifically call out and describe some of these points along the way. I wanna initially talk about our culture of improvement and then I'm gonna be focusing in on our focus on culture, safety, and high reliability. Eventually, I'm going to talk about solutions for patient safety. What was most important about that is about 10 years ago, a little bit more now, we came to the realization that we would never achieve our goal of zero harm if we continued to learn specifically alone and just with what we were accomplishing at one organization. We came to realize because we learned from other industries that the only way to make significant breakthroughs in safety is by going at it as an entire industry together. No organization has the power or the harm to learn from to do it alone. And we deeply believe that learning together has been a great accelerator for our journey and we believe also for the uh, nation as a whole. I am also going to talk about that last box called Safer Together because it's a focus on psychological safety. And I'm going to tell you why we've been focused on that for the last two years and how we've approached that. So we uh, learned from other organizations, and I want to specifically call out Brent James and his work at Intermountain Healthcare starting decades ago with the uh, belief that it's going to be crucial and remains crucial for healthcare leaders 
in healthcare improvers to truly understand the science of improvement. Dr. Lachman talked about Dr. Deming and all of his work and other great leaders in this. Initially, we sent people elsewhere to learn qual uh, quality improvement. Eventually, we realized that wasn't going to work. We needed to build our own programs, both for those at the front line who needed the basics, leaders who needed to learn not just how to lead improvement, but also how to teach improvement, and then ultimately all the way to people who needed to be research leaders in this work. And more recently, we've uh, broken out from our healthcare focus and are now teaching improvement all across our region to pe uh, individuals and groups from uh, focusing on other social determinants of health, uh, like housing, social services, and education, particularly with kids. I put the link on here because that's really all I want to share on this to let you know that this has been fundamental. It continues to be fundamental for us. And we've really gotten to the point now where we've trained over a thousand leaders. Initially, again, as I mentioned, focusing on Cincinnati Children's, but more recently now we're training people from organizations from all across the US now. Now I wanna jump into our journey on safety culture. This slide has been uh, with us throughout our journey of safety. Let me explain what you're looking at here. The y-axis is describes the rates of harm. Uh, what is the risk of being harmed? It's in factors of 10, way at the bottom. Your risk of being harmed is one out of 10, one out of 100, then one out of 1,000, all the way up to one out of a million, one out of 100 million. And our theory, adopted from others, we did not develop this theory, but the theory is, that we need, as Dr. Bates mentioned, reliable processes, but we needed to focus on our safety culture and ultimately human factors, as Dr. Lachman was speaking to. And what I wanna uh, share with you is our journey, which is really so intertwined with the theories that Dr. Lachman was laying out of high reliability. We've deeply learned from the work from Dr. White and Dr. Sutcliffe. In fact, I've been able to work closely with Dr. Sutcliffe over time. We've been able to publish together because their work when they started was not in healthcare. It was describing high reliability organizations, organizations that were able to achieve a performance on safety that was way out of proportion to what they should be doing based on the danger of their work. And they described these organizations in the environment that they worked in. They were not talking about hospitals when they originally did this work. But over time, we realized their descriptions of what these other organizations like wild firefighting or naval aviation or nuclear power were experiencing were essentially similar to what we were experiencing in hospitals. And so our journey at the beginning was not learning from within healthcare, it was learning from outside healthcare. My individually, personally, and with teams of people, we spent a lot of time working with and learning from these other industries. I personally was able to spend time on an aircraft carrier out in, in the sea, learning about situation awareness and deference to expertise. But we also have been mentored and tutored by uh, experts from nuclear power, from civil aviation. Uh, we worked with Dr. Carrion that Dr. Lachman uh, talked about, all with the goal of trying to figure out what from these other industries was applicable to healthcare, possibly, and then applying it at Cincinnati Children's and learning as we go. And we've come to the belief that this is what ultimately this journey should look like for us. And we've made great progress on this. But of course, as I've emphasized, we're not there yet. We're trying to improve every day. But we believe we should be aware of all harm, not at the end of the day, not at the end of the week, not at the end of the month, but immediately. And all should be aware of this harm, that it's happening so we can learn immediately and hopefully reduce the harm level. We need to be aware of all risk continuously. 
that was mentioned in the in the outpatient work uh, from Brigham and Women's. Uh, but to get to where we want to be, we can't simply react to risk. We have to predict risk so we can manage it effectively. Harm reduction needs to be owned by everyone, by all leaders, not by a central team, not by the, just the senior leaders of the organization. Everyone needs to own the harm. Frontline teams need to feel supported, not most of the time, not generally, every shift. Frontline teams need to believe and it needs to be real that if they need help, help comes immediately. We've learned that from so many other industries, particularly I wanna call out Toyota has taught us so much about that. And then we need to learn. I've emphasized the importance of being a learning organization. We need to learn from errors every day. Dr. Lockman called out the characteristics of HROs and as he uh, called out uh, several importance and I just wanna build on that and say, we totally agree about the importance of the second one here, sensitivity to operations, which again, Dr. Bates was talking about this ability to predict harm. We've created a system over the last 10 years where every child in our organization, every shift has a risk prediction of their risk to, de to deteriorate over the next shift. And this information is shared widely. Everyone, including our ICU, and other uh, important members of our care team know which children we believe are at the highest risk of deterioration. And we've had dramatic reductions in unrecognized deterioration simply by building that system that doesn't wait for people to call for help. We describe what help might be needed in the next eight hours every shift through huddles and uh, that escalate throughout the organization every shift. And all these principles, we've tried to spell out details. And this is work that I really uh, credit Dr. Sutcliffe with. But we share this information with all of our leaders. But this document I'm showing is actually one that we now share across every children's hospital uh, in the United States and Canada. And this is actually a document that you can get on that Solutions for Patient Safety website that I was telling you about. We want to share all of this so we can all learn together. I wanna to talk about constancy of purpose that Dr. Lockman mentioned. These are our goals. I've told you our vision is to be the leader in improving child health, but every year and every five years, we create goals of where we're going. And ultimately in terms of safety, we've set goals of zero. Zero serious harm for patients and zero serious harm for staff. We have not achieved that, but we believe the only way for our organization to move forward is to have a goal of zero. We do not know yet how to achieve this, but that's common in healthcare. That's why we have research. That's why we have academic facilities to learn our way into to these uh, this new world, this new uh, level of safety. We believe that by setting goals of zero and then annual targets along the way, it pushes us not to look just what we can achieve today, but what new information, new knowledge and new systems are necessary to achieve that harm, which Dr. Bates and Dr. Desai were explaining what they're doing at Brigham and Women's, which was fascinating. I'm just gonna share a little bit of data, not to go in depth on any of it, but to more emphasize probably our key learning on use of data was to be transparent. This particular chart I'm showing it is a rolled up metric that we use that combines all of the serious harm that patients befall. Uh, this is spelled out monthly, but we share this information with every person in our organization. Every, this data is available to literally every person continuously. There is no secret data that is only available to leaders. The data is available to everyone. And more importantly than charts like this, we learn about the harm every day. If there is a, an event that uh, causes harm to a patient, it will be announced to the entire organization tomorrow morning on our organization-wide huddle. We will not announce the name, but we will announce what happened 
and what we're doing to learn from it. Because our expectation is if harm happens today, we have a learning huddle within 24 hours. And in our case, we actually include the families so that they can help us learn what happened and what can we do to improve. We have a similar chart that I'm showing you here for employee or workforce safety. Again, the same holds true. We share this data widely with everyone. And if there is a harm that befalls one of our staff today, it too will be announced to everyone in the organization. No names, but we will announce what type of harm happened and what kind of learning we're achieving from that. And then finally, the, um, I also want to talk about an overall uh, chart that we use called serious safety events, which uh, tracks the worst of the worst types of harm. It's where a deviation from standard causes severe harm to a patient, potentially even death. Over the years, when we first started this work, we were averaging a serious safety event every 21 days, more than one per month. Eventually, over 10 years, we were able to get that rate down to uh, zero to two per year. We even went an entire year with no serious safety events. Two years ago, that rate began to climb again. And so beyond just studying individual events, we did a deeper dive on what was happening in the organization. We went to the front line and asked them, what is happening that's making this serious safety events go up? And what they told us that we didn't want to hear, but what they told us was the culture of safety is not as strong as it needs to be. And specifically, they told us we do not have adequate psychological safety at Cincinnati Children's. We will not achieve improvement unless we focus on psychological safety. I'm going to explain what we've done, but I will tell you ahead of time what it's done to our organization is over two years, we've now reduced the serious safety event rate back to where it should be. So we learned from the front line, we implemented changes, and it appears to be working. What we did is we looked around at what programs might be available to teach all of us a new way on psychological safety. We didn't find one that we were comfortable with for our organization, so we created our own. And we eventually trained all of our leaders on what they need to do to improve and achieve psychological safety. And then we required every one of our leaders, over 1,000 leaders, to then teach their team, to personally teach their team. We didn't bring in trainers. We required the leaders to train themselves. So the leaders need to learn about psychological safety. They needed to learn about what culture they need to create. And then they needed to teach it personally to show commitment and knowledge of psychological safety. There's so much I could share about this, but the one thing I really want to emphasize is that what we learned, most important, particularly for leaders, is not the speaking up part, it's the listening part. And most importantly, learning to listen with grace and gratitude. It's the respect part that Dr. Lachman was bringing up. Everyone needs to feel that their concern is respected. It may not be right. That doesn't matter. They need to know that they'll be listened to with grace and gratitude. We finished all of the training right before the pandemic started. The pandemic has been terrible, but the one silver lining for our organization is it became an excellent way for us to improve our skills on psychological safety and used the basics that we had just all learned together to learn how to manage the pandemic. And together, we were able to create what most people considered, both our staff and the families who use our organization, is an incredibly safe harbor in and amongst all the uh, fear and uncertainty of COVID. And it allowed a way to speak up both about concerns and our leaders of our organization learned how to both speak up honestly, but also how to listen up with grace and gratitude as we all 
have been dealing with our concerns, both for ourselves and for our patients. Now I'm gonna to move to the uh, learning from the network before I wrap up here. And, but if any of this uh, causes you want to learn more, the one other thing I will share with you is that um, the Anderson Center, our hub for safety and quality at Cincinnati Children's is celebrating our 10th anniversary. And one of the things we're doing is conducting a series of five webinars. It's all free. There's no charge for any of this, but it's a chance because people are constantly coming or wanting to come to Cincinnati Children's to learn. So in this year of the pandemic, we said, since we can't have anybody over to learn right now, we're putting all we can out through these webinars. Uh, you'll see the dates. You, you can see a link to if you want to learn more. We're also going to archive them so they'll all be available in case these dates and times uh, don't work for you. But I'd encourage you, if anything I've shared makes you want to learn more, here's one opportunity to learn more uh, over the next um, uh, six weeks. So now I want to finish up by moving beyond Cincinnati Children's. And I emphasized the breakthrough learning that we had that we were not going to achieve our goal of zero harm if we learned alone. And some really uh, amazing leaders at both our children's hospital at the time and other children's hospitals in our state, which is called Ohio, came together and realized that they together were all on a journey towards zero harm. And they made the decision, really a fundamental decision that although we may compete on some things, these leaders made the decision that we would no longer compete on safety. In fact, they made the decision that it was immoral to compete on safety. And what that allowed us to do for the first time ever, all the children's hospitals in our state, it was eight children's hospitals, agreed that we would all start sharing our data together. We standardized our data across all of our hospitals began sharing it every month. And then probably more important, we agreed we would share everything we're doing, both what's working and what's not working together. We initially focused on surgical site infections and adverse drug events. And we resulted in significant reductions across our entire state, more than 50% reductions in both of those across the entire state. And eventually what that led us to do is agree that we would start working together to eliminate serious harm. And then we decided it was time to go beyond just our state, our eight children's hospitals. And we decided to invite others from across the United States to join together. Now, 10 years later, we are over 140 children's hospitals working together uh, across so far across the United States and Canada. But perhaps opportunities to go beyond uh, just the United States and Canada as we look forward to the future. And we account for, it's actually probably closer to 75% of the pediatric admissions across our two countries. And we all have the same commitment. We will not compete on safety. We will share all of our data together and we will share all of our learnings together. And we do this continuously. And what has happened is the journey on for safety for pediatrics and for children's hospitals has changed forever. None of us keep our data private anymore. We share everything with each other. And the improvement has uh, really picked up the pace. I'll show you some data in just a second. But I'm also just going to draw your attention one more time to that website, solutionsforpatientsafety.org. It's all free. But one document is uh, that came out about a year ago is we actually studied, uh, I think it was six to eight of the children's hospitals that were making the fastest progress. And we put in one document what they seemed to be doing that were best practices, not for one type of harm, but for overall to move their organization forward. It's a fascinating uh, document and it, it's all there. It's really the voice of leaders from across multiple children's hospitals. And I'm back on that same uh, slide uh, talking about our theory to eliminating harm. But what I want to talk about with solutions for patient safety is this first curve. And to show you very effectively how we've changed by being able to work together. 
what we all do every single month, we all share our data, two types of data. The first type of data is what are we doing to prevent a certain type of harm and how reliably are we doing that at our organization? And then we also share the second type of data, which is what's our uh, rate of that harm at our organization? And then we're able to combine all of that data together every single month. Together, all of our children's hospitals essentially created the largest data set there's ever been. And it gets larger every month that shows the connection between what process, what prevention step you're taking and how reliably it's uh, happening. And then what type of, what rate of harm are you having? And we've been able to, by taking this approach, totally change the way evidence is created for children's hospitals and safety. We all now create our own evidence and it's updated every single month. We've been able to show with statistically significant proof what process steps work, which ones do not work. And we're able to show if you do a certain prevention step and you do it reliably, what rate of harm you can expect to accomplish. Will this get us all the way to zero? No, but it has resulted in dramatic reductions in harm. And we've created an entire system that goes from new ideas through learning uh, through the data to uh, eventually adoption of a standard bundle by all hospitals in SPS and eventually sustaining it and then sharing it with everyone, not just within our network, but everywhere through our website. So what's happened? Well, the data changes every month because we're constantly making improvements, but this is just a uh, sampling from the last year on the total number of children that have been spared harm right there in the middle. It's over 18,000. Those harms, which always cost the health system uh, uh, money, have resulted in a reductions of over uh, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. And also the data I'm sharing you there is how we're doing this, how often we, we share the data, charts that we share every month. You can see that we share thousands of charts every month across the network. And we, if you're wanting to see more, again, on the website, we share all of our data there, specific run charts, et cetera, not for individual hospitals, but for the network as a whole. You can see it. We want to share everything we're doing to help others, even if they can't be part of SPS. And we put our bundles out there. These are all, all have statistically significant data that shows why they work, how they work. The data is all there. And it also gets into the details of these bundles, including videos and other helpful material that shows what work, uh, what works and then how to implement these bundles. And again, these are available to everybody in the world. Uh, there's nothing that we're doing that we don't share once we have statistically significant data that shows how it works. And then finally, before I end, I just wanna talk about the fact that this journey is far from over. I really agree with the other panelists. We've made progress, but we need to make progress faster and deeper than what we've been able to do so far. And just calling out some specifics that we can continue to learn from other industries within our industry. The importance of workforce safety. We've come to believe both at our organization, Cincinnati Children's, but really across the network, that we will not achieve the breakthroughs in patient safety unless we create safe work environments. The, the staff who we ask to commit their hearts and their efforts to keep the patient safe, they need to feel safe and they need to be safe. We're focusing on the importance of perioperative safety, not just should you use a huddle, but getting into details of, of how to prevent injuries to both our workforce and the patients. As mentioned by Dr. Lockman, we need to learn about equity and we need to close gaps, both uh, in our country uh, based on race and ethnicity, but also through social determinants of health. We have data that shows there's differences based on those factors and there should not be. Very uh, strong work by Dr. Desai and others uh, on ambulatory safety, we totally agree. I mentioned our focus on situation awareness and uh, clinical deterioration, but uh, merging that with the uh, AI and ML work that Dr. Bates was talking about is where we can eventually potentially get to zero harm. 
and then I just want to emphasize one more time on the psychological safety. I think all of us know that hospitals are tough places. There's often hierarchies, but we need to continue to make breakthroughs on psychological safety to get where we want to go. So I'll just wrap by saying this is definitely a journey. I wanted to share where we are with our organization, and hopefully it helps you. Uh, and um, gracias. Muchas gracias, Dr. Mutin, por su excelente presentación. Espero poder tenerlo presencialmente el próximo año o en los años venideros. También muchas gracias de nuevo al doctor Lachman, el doctor Bates y a la doctora Sonay. Espero verlos pronto. Tenemos para ustedes esta propuesta que les puede parecer interesante. Hacerse fellow en calidad y seguridad del paciente en la clínica en Banaco del Grupo Quirón Salud con el auspicio de la Universidad del Valle. Mayor información la pueden encontrar en la descripción en la pantalla. Y ya estamos agendando el nuevo simposio, el doceavo simposio internacional de calidad y seguridad del paciente para el próximo 2022. Posiblemente será entre el 13 y el 15 de abril de dicho año. Les agradecemos a todos nuevamente. Mucho agradecimiento a Roche por su patrocinio a nuestro evento. Ha sido muy importante y nos vemos mañana a las 12.00 hora de Colombia. Gracias.